good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to this um, very informative speech that will be a um, presentation for the um, Australian War Memorial NAIDOC program for 2019. I'm Michael Bell. I'm Indigenous Liaison Officer at the Australian War Memorial. I'd like to welcome you all to my country, the traditional owners of this land of the Ngunnawal people. I'm a Ngunnawal Gomeroy man. On behalf of my elders, I'd like to acknowledge that the elders, past and present, and also any traditional countries and peoples that are represented here today, I'd like to pay my respects to your elders and also your continuing ongoing custodianship of your lands, your customs, your law. I'd like to pay my respects to those that have served, those that are still serving and the families that have loved and supported those people from um, inception of, of Australian defence. Also, I'd like to thank and welcome uh, Lieutenant, uh, Colonel Tim... Uh, <laughs> Tim Rutherford, sorry, and um, thank him for his presentation. Tim um, has been working closely with the um, Cape communities, more specifically the Woodja Woodja community where he's been adopted as a, um, a member of that community, which shows how important his work is for our community. And I've worked with Tim for about 18 months now and we've, we've showed him and shared him some information that we have at the Australian War Memorial about um, the people of the community up there. So we're working closely together with our communities at the Australian War Memorial and, and Tim has encapsulated that in this talk and it's a very informative talk and um, we hope, hope you learn. But um, on behalf of the Ngunnawal people, thank you. And I also like to acknowledge that the Australian War Memorial in recognising our protocol is paying cultural respects to the Ngunnawal people and also to Aboriginal protocol and processes throughout Australia. Enjoy the talk. Enjoy the speech and there'll be time for questions afterwards and um, Tim is a very engaging. I'd like to welcome to the stage Colonel Tim Rutherford. Uh, Yalada. Uh, my name's Wandi. Uh, my, my spirit name uh, from the Gugu Yalanji people up on uh, 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 Annan River on Cape York. Uh, grew up in uh, Darawal in Sydney uh, my spirit home is sea country, uh, and so on behalf of the elders of the Guru Yilanji, I want to extend my respects uh, to Michael, the Ngunnawal people, uh, their elders past, present and emerging, uh, and thank them for the opportunity for me to come here and speak today. Uh, today's speech will, will address really, uh, we're a pretty intimate crowd, so um, feel free to, to shout out at any point if you want me to pause. But it occurred to me as uh, Michael had sent through the program for NAIDOC week that we were spending a lot of time reflecting on the past and the deep past. And I thought it appropriate to capture a point in time and also show a little bit about what we're doing now and into the future um, to give it some, some context and show the trajectory that we're on. And I think that trajectory is relatively positive. To, to help me out, I, I'm going to talk across four areas. Uh, the first thing I want to do is just highlight a few of the assumptions that set the context that, you know, build upon some of the talks that have occurred this week, and in particular, uh, Dr Brendan Nelson's speech last, last week, the recorded speech from the book launch, which was really apt, and I'm going to steal a couple of points from that. Uh, and then I want to talk about how our history started from a disparate point, it's converged, and we're, now we're shooting together off into the future. And if you think about the NAIDOC theme this year of voice treaty and truth. I think for these bottom three points you could probably invert that. I want to talk about a disparate history of truth. I want to talk about closing a gap, a treaty, and I want to talk about a voice of a shared future. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go. The false assumption is Europe is a cultural breakdown of Europe and it's not dissimilar now as it was 250 years ago when Captain Cook set sail. It's not dissimilar now to about 240 odd years ago when the first fleet arrived. And they saw Australia as this. One colour, terra nullius, we've heard the term. But importantly, they didn't think of the locals and the locals that were engaged, they thought of as one homogenous group. One of the ways we know they thought of it as a homogenous group is, uh, for the scholars amongst you, you'll know that when Captain Cook and his voyage of discovery hit Australia on the east coast, Point Hicks, and moved north up the coastline, wherever they stopped 
uh, alongside and went in to meet with the locals. The locals withdrew into the bush, which was, which was traditional practice. It wasn't until he got to Cooktown, today's Cooktown, uh, that he first had a conversation with some of the locals. It was the Gugu Yimadira people uh, who are the traditional owners of the Cooktown area. And that's where the word kangaroo came from. And so as he engaged with them, wanted to know what that marsupial was that they'd seen hopping around, looked quite bizarre. The locals said, that's a kangaroo. Joseph Banks wrote that down and took it to London. Ten years later, when they set off with the first fleet and they were going through the archives of things to expect, Joseph Banks had said to uh, Arthur Phillip and his team, you'll see a strange-looking marsupial, it's a kangaroo. Now, when they landed about here in Botany Bay, Darawal country, and said to the locals, we know this word, this is kangaroo, and the response was translated, I don't know what that is, which has set off the folklore that some of you will know of, that kangaroo means I don't know an Indigenous. Well, it does if you're a Darawal, but there's a different language completely spoken up if you're a, a, a Google Yimitir. So we skip forward. That's the Australia that we know. That's as close a recollection as we can get, actually. It's not, it's not true, but it's near enough. It's about 40 years old. That's the Atsis map. It's got a whole lot of inaccuracies, but it's better than, than most things. So we know we have this rich tapestry of Australian landscape in culture. As settlement started to progress out about 250 years ago, there wasn't consideration of that. People pushed and pushed into different lands, into different nations of people, and slowly but surely started to consume. That sort of sets a context for how we've ended up in what I'll call a disparate history. The disparate history was something that Brendan Nelson spoke so eloquently about, and I wouldn't hope to be able to speak as fluently as he. But what we see here is the, uh, the Ruby Plains Massacre 1. It's a piece that's been acquired by the gallery, hangs in the colonial section, and is a really important piece. It talks of the killing time where this painting depicting the slaughter of seven Indigenous men for one bullock they had killed. It's not an isolated incident. This is from the Kimberley. But this is a time that we would think perhaps 250 years ago, but actually it was somewhere between 1880 and 1900, certainly in the lifetime of the people who would later go on to serve our country. But the sorts of massacres depicted in this painting weren't isolated to the Kimberley. This is a map of tropical North Queensland. Yeah, my sea country up the top here uh, in, in around Cooktown, Daintree area. Those yellow spots are massacre sites that have been identified by Dr Timothy Botton. Some of those sites we were able to distill through the place names they have today. Skeleton Creek, where umpteen skeletons have been found and pastoralists, about a century ago, decided that was a good name for it. Skull Cove on the Yarrabah Peninsula, where a dozen beheaded Aboriginal uh, heads were put on spikes as a warning to the locals. These place names still exist if you were to drive there today. It masks a, a pretty turbulent history. And again, that turbulence wasn't centuries ago. That turbulence was the turn of the century. That turbulence was in the lifetime of men who would sign up to defend Australia in the First World War. These two here, these Argies from uh, Gugu Yalanji, uh, Gugu Nungu, Charlie and Norman Baird. They enlisted in 1915 at a time when massacres were occurring around them, massacres perpetrated by the country that they were going overseas to protect. They were serving alongside some of the perpetrators, some of the children, some of the cousins of the perpetrators of that violence. They were going to fight, they were going to suffer, and some of them were going to die to protect a country that at that stage had denied their Aboriginality, had denied their rights and their freedoms. These two men, in cultural way, when they sit down to eat, you can't eat with... Uh, with someone who uh, isn't family. 
you, you in, inherit their toxins as you, as you share food. So by sitting down and eating with, at this stage, I'll call them the whites in the army, they were adopting them as family. And for the four years, they served in campaigns. Charlie in the light horse, 11th light horse, Norman in the 15th battalion. They survived the war and returned home. For that brief moment in their life, they were equals. There was no skin, it was green colour. Otherwise, they were two men sharing an experience with their peers. We skip forward now into the start of the Second World War and we think a little bit more about how much, potentially how little has changed. The map here shows the Japanese advance through the Southwest Pacific. This line of defences shows where Australia was prepared to fight them off. You'll see this little speck just north of that line, south of Papua New Guinea, the Torres Strait. Worst case, we were going to let the Torres Strait go. And from a strategic point of view, it makes sense. It's a large moat, and that's pretty useful when you're trying to defend big things. But in, in history, in society, not a whole lot had changed for our Indigenous men and women. And yet, when the time came to defend Australia, once again, they stepped forward. In the case of the, uh, the Torres Strait, uh, I would say a relatively little known unit uh, called the Torres Strait Light Infantry was formed. The Torres Strait Light Infantry had the highest rate of enlistment of any unit or demographic in Australia at the time. Almost every able bodied man joined the TSLIB. It's Australia's first and only ever Indigenous unit, and it survived the war with its men fighting up into Papua New Guinea at a time when the Japanese were bombing Horn Island on the southern end of the Torres Strait, the second most bombed location in Australia. They left their families to fend off an advancing Japanese horde, an advancing Japanese horde who at that stage had a history of, of abuses um, for anything that they had occupied. They left their families alone on the islands to defend Australia. It's a pretty impressive a statistic. What to me is more, more impressive is that they did it for one third of the pay of their white counterparts. Now, Torres Strait Islanders, and, and I've had the privilege to, to serve alongside some for a little while, are proud people, and we will know one of the more famous, Koiki Mabo, uh, as a sort of spearhead. But it's a, it's a cultural aspect that they pride themselves on, their self-belief. Uh, in, in the Torres. And so being paid one third was not good enough for them. So they went on strike in December 1943. And they came back to work when they'd been given a 100% pay rise. They served out the war earning two thirds the pay of every other white soldier in the Australian military at the time. Many years later, 1986, the government saw fit to back pay their families the, the balance and, and rights were corrected. But Torres Strait Light Infantry a proud, proud group. So if we think of that as a truth, a truth of where we were, you know, less than a century ago. Can anyone point out who the chap on the left is? Yeah, you would know, wouldn't you? About from a little further back. Reg Saunders. Anyone know what is important about Reg Saunders? Yeah, you would know. First Indigenous Commissioned Officer, that's right. So Reg served through the Second World War. He enlisted as a soldier, son of a soldier, a First World War veteran. And at that stage, to be an Indigenous soldier, you had to deny yourself your Aboriginality. Because you weren't of predominantly European descent, you weren't allowed to enlist. So Reg's father, later Reg, had done that. He served with distinction throughout North Africa, throughout Europe and later in Papua New Guinea. And it was at that time, finally, after years of observing him in combat, that his leadership skills that had always been there were recognised and he was recommended to go and complete officer training, which he did. The photo there is uh, of Reg 
on his graduation day um, as the first Indigenous officer in the Australian military. Now, after the war, Reg retired from the military and went on to life, uh, working in the mining area, uh, which is kind of apt. The, uh, the Korean War started some years later and Reg re-enlisted. One of the things Reg is most known for is uh, being the commander of Charlie Company, 3rd Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, for the Battle of Capiong. Now, if you don't know about the Battle of Capiong, I won't do it justice. There's some brilliant dioramas here. I would, I would really uh, recommend you go and check them out. But in short, it's where a handful of Australians from the 3rd Battalion uh, with some Canadian counterparts held back the better part of uh, China's division. Um, so numbers-wise, a couple of hundred versus tens of thousands. That's a big deal. 3rd Battalion celebrate the Battle of Kapiong as their unit birthday now. Every year, it's a marked occasion. They were awarded the US uh, President's Citation, which they, members of the unit still wear today. Reg was on the ground for that. But it did mark a little bit of a watershed in how we were starting to see service and understanding why it was that we fought. Something that I think had long been taken for granted was as much as there was a culture of service inside our Indigenous communities, in, in my opinion, uh, it, it's more about you have protectors and you have providers. And protecting country is a strong influence uh, and a motivation for people to serve. As we transitioned from the Korean War and the Vietnam War, we started to think a little bit more about how we operate in small villages. How, how do we influence? How do we, how do we understand country enough to be able to defend? And if we're understanding overseas, maybe we can understand it here. Man in the top right. Smokey, I've got to give it to you. Major General Mike Jeffries. Uh, former Governor General of Australia. At this stage, and, and, and you know, spare me, I, I, I couldn't find a photo of him from 1977, but General Jeffries was what we would call uh, in, in uh, Yolanji uh, the crocodile story. The crocodile story is where the head goes, the tail's going to follow. Uh, you, you lead. And this is what he's done. Other than his Vietnam service, and, and he was the commander of the SAS, he'd also served for many years in Papua New Guinea, working and leading uh, the, the Papua New Guinea infantry. The threats to Australia at this point were all talking about communism and how it was coming down. We had to think about how we may defend the country. And so based on his experiences in Vietnam of having to understand country and the connections there and how that can make things quite difficult for people, and importantly, his understanding and value of culture he drafted a paper, and it's a cracking paper uh, from a military perspective. Um, and it talked about maybe we could get a mobile land surveillance force that operated in the north of Australia, tasks that until this time had been done by the SAS periodically. His proposal was we could get a whole bunch of the locals from the different communities, we could give them some SAS leadership, for the units and the, the teams. We trained them in just that part of the SAS tactics that they would need to do reconnaissance over long distances and arduous things, and more importantly, how they can communicate that information back into Army. And so that was the birth of what became the Regional Force Surveillance Units. Now, he had proposed seven. We ended up with three. These units still exist. Together, they're probably responsible, you draw those red lines together, about 50, 52% of the country. The Pilbara Regiment over on the west, North Force in the centre, and the 51st Battalion over on the, on the right there. Looks pretty small on the map, but actually those red boxes are, are fairly large. Uh, it's about 1.2 million square kilometres, about 1.8. Uh, my battalion, the 51st, we were, we were the baby, we had 650,000 square kilometres, uh, but we had 72 different cultural groups and the Torres Strait, uh, so not the easiest to navigate. But it was General Jeffries and his ideas that stimulated this. The crocodile story, 
change takes time and it needed to be led. And in my opinion, the leadership of Indigenous service in Army for the next 20 or 25 years was through the RFSUs. There were trickles. Uh, of others that would go into mainstream Army, Navy and Air Force, and, and I don't neglect the other services, but I can't you know, profess to be an authority. But it was the RFSUs that led for the next 20 or so years. But as with everything, over time, we sometimes lose sight of what was the original idea, and things can have a trajectory that sort of dampens off. A similar thing had happened with the RFSUs. They have all of this space, all of this potential, and yet a handful of years ago when I first came to be working with them, they were mostly focused on the capital cities. Believe it or not, Perth, Darwin and Cairns, and that's where their centres of, of the unit were. There's not a huge Indigenous population in those areas. So we then had to, to think about things differently. The point I'd make about these areas as we talk closing the gap, and, and I am going to talk closing the gap more generally now for a second, is statistically there are 3% of Australians that would identify as ATSI, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Of those three, 65% of them lie inside of the RFSU areas combined. Those 65%, 11% of those living in very remote communities speak a language other than English as their primary. More than 50% of them will be unemployed. 20% of ATSI women will have experienced physical or sexual violence in the last year. 300% more likely to have experienced sexual violence than other women. 50% aged between 15 and 65 have some form of disability. 28% of all adult and 48% of all juvenile are uh, incarcerated and a life expectancy less than 10 years uh, of anyone born outside of that area. So we talk closing the gap and the context, the disadvantage is greatest in these areas. The opportunities that Army had at this point had been concentrated into the areas, perhaps not where that need was greatest. A revival happened a couple of years ago. Uh, there were a handful of people who had started to see the world in a similar way to General Jeffries. And if I was to put my lens on it, I actually think it was a lot to do with our service in East Timor, a lot to do with our service in Iraq, a lot to do with our service in Afghanistan that allowed us to start seeing that cultural break a bit differently and to realise that there is a whole lot of value here. We just need to tap it um, from a military perspective. And it's getting the narrative right. We weren't tapping it to say, come and join army and do good army things. That narrative doesn't work. It has to be something that's intrinsic, something that would have stimulated, you know, RG's Charlie Norman to have joined 100 years earlier in the midst of all of that violence that was happening around the regions. And it's the love of country. It's protecting country. And that's what the narrative became. And the first part of understanding uh, has to be open, inquisitive, and realising the value of the communication you're having. So this pivot started to occur within the RFSUs. We started to take great pride in the storytelling through art. We started to take great pride in being involved in ceremony. We started to take great pride in meeting all of the different cultures that we were exposed to and understanding and rebuilding trust. Once we were in community and you get past that superficial level of communication, you get to the nitty gritty of it. In these communities, mental health is a big deal. A lot of them are violent and, and spirituality runs quite strong. Uh, to help us overcome that, we were introducing a whole bunch of other programs with previous uh, veterans that were, were helping us out. In this case, uh, a bunch of guys uh, from Kapani, um, veterans from Somalia, uh, and they recognised the potential that, that could be um, fostered out in community. Part of that is empowerment. Part of that is 
They're violent places. Allow them an outlet and don't be turned off by that. And so they were set challenges like this. Impossible tasks. What you can't see is this guy's strapped to another guy with a, a belt and they're trying to pull each other out of the tent. It's the most simple of things to do, but for them it was something that they could do and express themselves. And once these generationally unemployed men started to find themselves, started to find their voice again, things started to happen. What we noticed was providing them some of these outlets um, through training, they started to want to work. And when they started to want to work, we said, we'll put you to work. I've actually got a need for a workforce that sits right over where you live. You don't have to leave home. You don't have to fly to a capital city. We'll pay you. We want you to stay in country, but more importantly, we want you to protect country, your country, our country. We want you to do it your way. We want you to bring all of the skills that you have in understanding country, understanding medicine, understanding the tides and the season through your song lines that have been passed down for millennia. And I want you to put that into practice to help us come up with a better game plan than we've had. So we did. And we were pretty successful. In, uh, in a 12-month period, just in the Cape York, we accounted for about half of all armies part-time Indigenous recruitment. We accounted for about 15 to 20% of all of Army's Indigenous recruitment over the 12-month period. They'd found fit to come and serve. They have wanted to work again. They had pride, which is not something you take for granted. In the town of Wujul Wujul uh, that Michael mentioned earlier, we saw it manifest through a whole bunch of things that we didn't expect. We saw public nuisance rates drop by about 60-odd percent. We saw employment rates rise. Now, if, if you're in community, CDP is the main employment pathway. Attendance rates are about 30%. We were finding anyone that was starting our training was attending at about 80, 86%. Metrics that we weren't really tracking closely at the beginning. The most important one for me and the one I'm, I'm most proud of is that in Wujul Wujul, which had been at that stage one of the top 10 domestic violence communities in the country, a community where not 18 months before uh, there'd been some quite terrible incidents of domestic violence where, where a lady was killed brutally um, uh, at the hands of a man uh, on the street. This community that had been in the top 10, we were able to reduce domestic violence rates by, by 33%. Now, the 33% is 33% less women uh, being hurt. More importantly to me, it starts to speak to the roles that the men and women are seeing, the pride, the respect and the responsibility that comes with that. Brings me to this picture. In along the way, when we were doing this recruitment, we came across this cohort of men. Now, there are some movers and shakers in community here. There's Neil, there's Clayton. These are the descendants of Charlie and Norman. Uh, from the First World War. They don't look much like Charlie and Norman. There's a century of a whole bunch of issues that we've just sort of talked about, disadvantage that's manifest in different ways that's come along here. But they're movers and shakers in community. Where they go, ten kids will follow them. Neil, he's illiterate, uh, and he had quite a history with, with domestic violence and, and other things substance abuse. But he understood the opportunity that we were, was being provided. He wanted to work. He didn't want to be in a cycle of disadvantage. So Neil started going to the library. He didn't go to the library because he can read. He went to the library because 10 kids would follow him wherever he went. And he saw his job now as a role model, protecting country. Protecting country doesn't mean you need to have a rifle in your hand. Protecting country means sometimes helping give a leg up to the next generation. So Neil would go to the library every afternoon and sit there. And when all the kids trundled in and followed him, the librarian would grab them all by the ear, put a book in front of them, make them read. Kids started reading. This has never happened in Wujul Wujul. The impressive part for me was the day that Neil couldn't make it to the library because he was off doing some work with us. And he'd made a roster of people to go and take his place so the kids never felt like it was up to them that they would be mentored through this process of education. 
it was transformational. Clayton, young fellow down the front here, descendant from Norman on the, uh, the picture. Now, as we started to move through the training, these guys got good. It wasn't a free pass. They were trained hard, and what had started with learning that niche of SAS tactics, well, that, you know, over time it, it distilled into something different, but still very much the non-traditional focus. These uh, men and women were being placed on border protection missions against mission profiles that I wouldn't have accepted as a boss in Afghanistan two years ago from a US Special Forces unit. We will put them 10 hours away from the nearest medical anything and tell them to remain undetected and help the border protection by making a surveillance screen, a tripwire. If anything comes across your tripwire, your camera, you radio it through, the Navy will go pick them up. And they do that. They do it with more pride than I've ever seen. But it's a hard gig. It means that you have to spend two weeks. I've had them out there during cyclones. I'd had them out there during the heat of summer and the monsoons. Um, and believe it or not, the colds of winter. And they'll lay on their bellies, not move and remain undetected for all that time. It's a really serious job and it, it's deserved of respect and it's the respect that they have inside of the military for a job that not many people can do. As this progressed on, it started to go full circle. Charlie, Norman, Neil, Clayton, fresh shaven, square of jaw, we had invited them into our family, army family, Greenskin, a year before. And through working and, and understanding them and spending time in community with our families, uh, which we do and, and we continue to do, um, they opened the door to us. Uh, and you see myself, uh, one of my officers, uh, Josh Mickle there, uh, the day that we were painted by community um, and given our names. Um, that was full circle we had closed a gap in this small part of the country. We invited them into our family and here we were a year later, them inviting us into theirs. It's quite a thing for a commanding officer of a unit that spans 72 nations, over 650,000 square kilometres, that's doing real-time border operations, um, you know, in a, in a fairly sensitive environment, to sit on a rock and have one of your newest members in the unit be the superior and paint me and, and now I commence my journey of learning um, language, learning culture, learning law, um, learning medicine, learning more things than I can remember and uh, my nanny Murray keeps beating me around the ears for it. We've come a long way. Which brings us to the, well okay, we've, we've come from a disparate future. We've had treaty. The voice now is us and I say us meaning Army. Culture-wise, sea country, every, every story, sea country story is going to involve like a fish or some sort of, you know, aquatic animal. Stingray story is the one that comes to mind here. And the stingray story is the, the tail protects the head. It's the barb. Now, if the stingray is Indigenous culture, then it's those few that have been exposed to it, such as myself, such as Major Josh, such as the 51st and the people who've served in the unit. It's our job to be the voice, to protect culture by fending off untruths when we see it, by accepting truths when we see them, but also advocating and breaking down some of those cultural barriers. And that's occurring, and that's part of the reason that, you know, I, I go out of my way to try and make myself available for anything that Michael asked me to do or, or certainly community asked me to do and fly back there as often as I can um, so that we keep in touch, so that we can protect culture, preserve it as we go forward. Fortunately for me, uh, you know, Army, Army senior leadership and Defence's senior leadership um, are very much supportive of the approach. And that approach has been pretty well received recently and they've made some great strides. There are a bunch of tailored pathways now that help in. They're not tailored pathways because we've lowered a standard. They're tailored pathways because we recognise that people have different learning modalities and sometimes if communication is about the audience, you have to take the audience's perspective and modality on board. And so maybe if you've grown up in a remote community, sitting through a classroom that you've never done in your life for weeks on end, which you've never done in your life, is not the best way to learn. 
But we could sit outside, we could have a yarn, we can be tactile, and we'll, we'll start to take on the knowledge that way. Defence has got that. There's a Defence Indigenous Development Program, Army Divi Indigenous Development Program, and they're starting to pay dividend. The dividend is, I think we're in front of the national target uh, right now for employment. There's people here who will correct me, but national target is about 2.7. We're at about 2.8% of service. 3 .1. We're at 3.1. Um. Giddy up, Army. Um, we're at 3.1%. Um, and we're on track to be 5% in, inside of the next two or three years. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but if we've got 3% of the nation identifying, then we're proportional. And that's what diversity is about. It's just giving everyone an equal share to be at the table so that we can get the collective wisdom of our perspective. We're on the path, and it's a positive path. So I'm going to put the video on now, and it sort of wraps up a bit of what I'm saying. And the voice you're going to hear is Clayton talking about his journey. Singing out to his peers. Ah, oh, I know plenty of tracks up and where I come from. Yeah, I just don't get lost at the bush. Yeah. I know which fruit and which animals I can feed off and I can live off the land. My job to go at at bush and at or at islands to protect the borders. We came ourselves up and trying to be invisible from others seeing us. When it first started, it was with two brothers, Norman and Charlie Baird. They had actually enlisted. So five generations later, we followed in their footsteps. And I guess for us, it was reconnecting with their song line with 51st Battalion. Why I joined the army is I saw my two great grandfathers fought in the World War One. I. I look like really good role model. Just wanted them to see me like in the green. When the other kids see him, the kids rush up to him and cuddle him. When I look at that, it makes me happier. Personally, I get a sense of pride. I get a sense of purpose as well, that I know that what I'm doing is to protect our way of life, our community, to protect your culture. In the army, it's like family. Friendship, respect. You get this type of vibe where you're loving every moment of this, and it's good. On Anzac Day, I marched it in front of my families. Oh, I felt really proud of myself. It's rained that afternoon. So I was thinking in my head, it was my two great grandfathers was crying up there for me. All the young men and women wants to join. If I can do it, you can do it. We've come a long way. Uh, we're not done. 
by any stretch. And there's still more to learn and, and we don't take the lessons we've learnt for granted nor do we take the privilege that we have for granted. But to me, the trajectory is positive and it's sometimes useful for us to remember that. I think we've come full circle. In, in many respects, we've inverted the experience that Norman and Charlie had a century ago. Uh, and now, with their descendants, Neil, uh, Clayton, um, you know, I think we're on a pretty good footing of immersing ourselves in culture, bringing that strength into what it is that we do. Um, and in the margins, been the tail of the stingray and helping to defeat untruths, promote truth. So we're the voice. I'll leave it there. I'm open to any questions people may have, uh, stories you might want to share um, as well. Are, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, just a question. I used to work at Sydney Melbourne Cooks in Metro Darling. Um, and there's a lot of people that work there. And it's quite interesting about administration because when you've not grown up in a non office environment, administration is the furthest thing from your mind. But of course, Army is the. It, it wants a certain amount of administration done. So, how do you make it work? Thank you for the first question on paperwork. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, no, look, it, it's, it is what makes the RFS use work. Uh, so we have an entirely different system to Army. Um, and I've described it previously as we're a point five. Um, whereas, you know, you know, Army deploys on operations, we all think Iraq or, or Afghanistan. And if you're at home, you must be training. And if you're a full-time soldier um, or you're a reservist, um, that, that's it. And so I often say, well, what happens if you're doing operations that you get a medal for, but you do it at home and you're a part-time soldier, but you work as much as a full-time soldier? Um, we're somewhere in the middle. There's this 0.5 argument for us. Army has given us a lot of flexibility. And so there are three people in Army who can enlist a soldier from a remote community and the chief. And that's the unit bosses. If, if I was away, it would have to be one of the other unit bosses to do that. And the reason they've done that is we accept a whole bunch of risk. We get people to go out and help them with paperwork. It's pretty hard uh, when you've got to still do the identity checks on teams of people who don't have a driver's licence, who've got three different names, profess to being from one region but come from another, uh, all of these sorts of things. So that's when our team of support staff have to come in, be indoctrinated very quickly to suspend judgement, to think with an open mind and just make it work. And so... I've had my teams rock around to Granny's houses in Aracoon at night. That's not a place you want to be, saying, hey, uh, you know, what happened to Marriott uh, today? And just let her go. And just be comfortable with letting her go. I'd never do this in Sydney and I wouldn't do it in Brisbane or Melbourne. But you know what? In Aracoon, you, you, you communicate to the audience and that's how they behave. So we have different administrative procedures and we've got a staff that are willing to do things differently to make it work. Um, and they do. Yes? That's a really good and complicated question. Uh, I think when we talk about, you know, um, you can't cram understanding any more than you can cram fitness, any more than you can cram wisdom 
It's just something that you have to practice and practice and you get better at. You get fitter, read more books, hopefully you get wiser. Um, and understanding, you're open, you're receptive, and over time you'll understand better. And I guess my, my purpose here is at this point in our trajectory, we understand much better than we did a century ago. And I would hope a lot faster than a century, but we will understand more tomorrow and more the day after. The crocodile story, well, the, the tail is following the head and, and the head is surging ahead. And so the tail is behind us. So the broader army is gonna reap the benefit of that. If we're up to me, I think we've done a lot of good things. I think we've started to look more nuanced about how we engage with cultures. I think there's a lot of nuance to go. I think, you know, with the best of intentions, we're still tripping over ourselves and we can sometimes cause offence. Suggesting that we do a smoking ceremony and it's, it's a smoking ceremony is good for all colours. It kind of ignores the diversity of the ATSIS map back at the start. Smoking ceremony is relevant for the country you're in, maybe not as relevant in other countries. You need to be careful with that. But, you know, we've, we've certainly taken great str strides in that. A caveat, so in my mind, Utopia is we've got rid of bagpipes in marching bands and we've replaced them with a didgeridoo and figured out a way that that guy can breathe and walk at the same time. Um, and also we've started to incorporate a bit more culture into our, our customs and traditions. Crocodile story, again, we've, we've just introduced spears into drill and ceremonial inside the RFSG for three RFS units. Um, so, you know, we're now starting to see ourselves more as Australia and, and less of a, uh, a European background. Now, we don't want to ignore all of the cultures. There are some good ones there too. So it's a process of time, but we'll be better tomorrow. We'll be better a day after. Does that answer? slowly, immersively. There's, there's a good argument between symbolism and substance when we make change. Um, and this was one of my great uh, criticisms of the first reconciliation action plan we did in defence. Um, and that was, it was all about symbolism. We're going to put flags in front of every building and you know, we're going to produce a magazine. And I thought at the time, and I, I reflect now pretty naively, that's not actually doing anything. We, we haven't improved the life of one person. But my naivety was, we're actually um, acclimatising people to that. Giving space and allowing it to happen. Um, and it's much stronger if those connections can be made um, over time than forced upon someone. That's one of those change management principles. So symbolism helps, I think, in starting to break down some of the paradigms and then you have to follow through. Navy's got a huge tradition in the Torres, in sea country, Heaps of islanders, uh, you know, want to join, and I know elsewhere in the Gulf country, Navy's presence is very strong. Bungary dance troupe, massive. You know, I wish we had one of those in army. I've got the Sarpai dancers um, from the Torres, um, but you know, they're pretty expensive. It's about fifty grand a week. Um, you know, fly them in from Ireland and stuff it takes time. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. They can, but we still don't want them to. Um, um, they are especially good at, at some of those key survival things of, um, in particular, less about food and more about I know what the weather's going to do. When this happens, I've got to go find somewhere to shelter because it's about to hammer rain or the wind's going to kick right off. 
what we're trying to do with some of their knowledge of land and, and country is um, where we have survival, you teach survival as a general skill, how we can all make a fire and make a shelter and stuff, and then you sort of go into advanced survival, which is, you know, how do you, you trap food, and then you go into regionally advanced survival, which is, yeah, OK, fish are everywhere, but actually if you're in this part of the country, you need to be fishing exactly like this if you want to get anything. Um, so we try and capture those lessons and bring them down. Um, patrol makeup's usually about 50-50, and so I can't underwrite a patrol based on 50% all, uh, all of the risk, but I can mitigate it. And we have had people stuck on islands for about a week longer than I would have liked because a cyclone came, three helicopters broke, and I couldn't get the ships out because of the sea state. But uh, those guys were pretty good then. Um, everyone was looking to them like Yoda. Um, you know. All right. Hope that answers. Um, all right. Well, hey, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your day. Uh, I know it's, everyone's pretty busy. I know the weather's miserable outside. Uh, if you do have a couple of extra minutes, I'd encourage you, really, uh, walk around some of the, the collection here. There's some brilliant things. Uh, and if you haven't taken the time already, you know, today's as good a day as any to do that. Um, the lessons in here are, you know, some specific, some universal. Um, they are mine. Um, so, you know, please, if you have any uh, questions or follow-up, Look me up. Michael's got my digits. Uh, more than happy to get in touch and have a yarn with any of you. But uh, other than that, I say yalla and uh, thank you. Thank you, Colonel Rather, for that. So um, on behalf of the War Memorial, Colonel, I'd like to thank you for coming to make that presentation. And it's very enlightening and a very different aspect and, um, of the history that you and knowledge that you've shared with us today. So thank you very much. And once again, I'd just like to um, get you to show your appreciation for the talk and information that Colonel's um, shared with us today. Thank you very much. You. Happy NAIDOC, everybody. Go in your own way. Enjoy. Go out. Be with your community. Share. Uh, celebrate cultures and community of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of our um, staff here throughout the whole entire week, especially Garth O'Connell, Erin Vink and the education team. Joanna, your coordination of our programs here this entire week have been fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a really, really powerful NAIDOC week for us here. Garth O'Connell, of course, is the ACT NAIDOC Person of the Year. He's up the back. And um, remember that when you go forward. But NAIDOC week is only one week, but it's every, every day. Share the, share the culture, share the knowledge and inquire because as, Tim, as Tim's highlighted in this talk, it's the understanding that will get us further. It's the knowledge and shared ability of our people to communicate and understand, and that comes through interaction. So thanks, have a good day, and thank you very much for supporting us. Brian, the RAP team, and you as, as Assistant Director, your support has been outstanding. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone.